just a quick double. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Restorative Justice Practices, Improving Outcomes for Justice Involved and At-Risk Youth. My name is Mindy Smith and I'm the Executive Director here at the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute. And I am incredibly excited to offer this webinar to you in partnership with the Council of State Governments and the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. Um, through a grant that's been uh, sponsored by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. As many of you probably know, and the reason you joined this webinar is that we as a juvenile justice field and related um, are facing really a, a growing concern around youth crime and violence. And as part of this, there's really an increased interest in adopting innovative programs, um, innovative practices that both hold youth accountable for their behavior while also really working to improve public safety and youth outcomes, such as education, behavioral health, family relationships, things like that. Simultaneously, the fact that many locales are struggling with an unprecedented level of staffing challenges within public agencies, but also private agencies and different service providers, there's really become an increased sense of urgency around identifying creative and effective interventions that are truly less staff and cost intensive. In this way, through the grant from OJJDP and in partnership with CSG and CJJR, we work together to conduct a thorough literature review on restorative practices and innovative programs being used in communities across the country, ranging from traditional restorative justice approaches to more of a grassroots type interventions that utilize credible messengers to reduce recidivism and improve outcomes for not only youth, but also for victims and communities. Today, we're going to hear an overview of that research and highlight some of the exciting programs doing the innovative work in this space, as well as share key considerations for implementing these types of programs and establishing promising researcher practitioner partnerships to increase our understanding of how to effectively implement these types of programs. And so I'm very excited to introduce to you our presenters today. We have Ashley LaCourse from the University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute. We have Sandra Santana from Community West or Community Works West, excuse me. We have Matthew and Aaron who are from the Collective Justice Restorative Community Pathways. And then we have Derek who is from American Institute for Research and International Institute for Restorative Practices. Each of them are going to take some time today to share with us a little bit more about restorative justice practices and innovative programs and really getting us get us thinking about what this might look like as we continue to explore um, ways to um, leverage the, the research and lessons learned from these great experts on the call today. And so we'll learn a little bit more about them before each presentation, but overall today we're going to spend time uplifting the importance of rigorous research. How do we use that to inform policy and practice? And then we're going to spend some time highlighting innovative practice interventions that are currently being implemented by the folks joining us on this webinar today. And then we'll wrap up with some recommendations and some key lessons learned from the research practice implementation and evaluation of different restorative practices and programs. And so without further ado, I am gonna hand it over to Ashley LaCourse who will get us started with learning a little bit more uh, around restorative justice practices across the juvenile justice system. Ashley. Thanks, Mindy. So first I'd like to begin with just a brief overview of restorative practices that are used with youth in the juvenile justice system. So obviously there are a variety of types of restorative practices used in the juvenile justice system, but the overarching purpose purpose of these restorative practices is really to emphasize repairing the harm done while holding, holding the individual responsible and accountable for their actions. This can be achieved in a number of ways. For example, victim offender mediation is a process that allows those who have been harmed, the victim, and those who caused harm, the justice involved youth, who consent to the process to meet in a safe and structured setting to engage in a discussion of, of the crime with a third party mediator. Family group conferencing is similar in nature to victim offender mediation, 
but it includes more people, such as those key supporters who are close to both the individual who was harmed and the youth who caused the harm. It might also include additional community members. Another approach is the use of community panels, otherwise known as community reparations boards. In these cases, the board discusses the incident with the youth who caused harm, as well as the consequences of that harm. They then develop proposed sanctions and discuss the youth with the youth until an agreement on the sanctions is made. Credible messengers and mentoring programs are more grassroots programs. They help youth by helping them build healthy relationships with positive adults. Inherent in this approach is the idea that the community is the best place to respond to the needs of its youth. Restitution or repaying the costs of the crime or the harm done is another restorative approach, as is teen, peer, teen and peer courts. These are programs designed to divert first time justice involved youth from more formal court proceedings. Instead, they're held accountable for their actions by other youth who determine their sanctions. As you likely know by virtue of being here, CSG Justice Center released a brief on the use of restorative practices with youth in the juvenile justice system. This brief was derived from a literature review conducted here at UCCI. The goal of this literature review was really to understand how well these restorative practices work with justice involved youth or youth at risk for justice system involvement. To understand the state of the research on these types of programs, we reviewed over 30 studies fitting our inclusion criteria. This resulted in studies that include youth between the ages of 11 to 18, where participants were mostly male, about 75%, and white, about 50 to 75% in these studies. These studies included a range of offense severity and type of crime, and most of the research looked at more traditional restorative justice practices of victim offender mediation and conferencing, but we did find some more grassroots programs that use mentors. Finally, studies explored the use of restorative practices in a variety of settings, both urban and rural, and included detention facilities, community settings, and schools. Overall, when looking at the research as a whole on restorative practices, we found that restorative practices seem to lead to better outcomes than processing through the traditional juvenile justice system. When they committed future offenses, youth sent through programs with restorative practices tended to commit less serious future offenses, and they remained offense-free in the community for longer periods of time than youth who went through the traditional system. Importantly, both the justice-involved youth and the person harmed tend to re report higher levels of satisfaction when going through these types of processes than through the traditional juvenile justice system. And finally, programs that use restorative practices tend to be highly cost-effective and result in increased compliance with restitution. Because the research is limited, any generalization should be taken with caution. However, in general, the research suggests that restorative practices are effective for diverse populations. Studies found positive results for youth between the ages of 11 to 18, and we also saw positive results for both genders, with some research suggesting they may be even more effective with girls. The findings related to race are a bit more mixed, but overall, the findings suggest that these types of practices are effective with a variety of races, although the cultural context of the programs should be taken into consideration. We also found positive results for youth with no prior history, as well as those with more ex extensive criminal histories. And we found the same for the, the severity of the offense. These practices can be effective with youth who commit property, drug or violent offenses, as well as misdemeanor and felony level offenses. We also found that positive findings were present in a variety of different settings, including detention, community, and school samples. In particular, we saw promising outcomes in schools for youth at risk of justice system involvement. And specifically, we saw that when these restorative practices are used with youth in schools, there tend to be fewer incidents of school-based conflict, such as suspensions or behavioral referrals. And finally, we saw that teachers who use restorative practices report more positive relationships with their students. Of course, there are a number of implications from this literature review. While we have some promising research, much of this has not been high quality, rigorous studies. This means that we need more research with, more, with stronger methodological designs to truly understand the impact of these practices. We also need more longitudinal research with longer follow-up periods, 
as many of these studies only follow youth for about 12 months. We also need to know more about who benefits from these programs. They tend to be used with lower risk youth, but some research suggests that they may be even more effective for high risk youth. These methodological limitations and implementation challenges faced by programs that are aiming to use restorative practices indicate that researchers and practitioners need to work together to better understand the impacts of restorative practices, hopefully allowing for those stronger methodological designs, longer follow-up periods, and more acceptance of higher risk youth in these programs. Finally, the cultural context of restorative practices may impact their effectiveness. Some studies noted that there were less robust impacts for non-white youth, suggesting that the cultural context may be an important aspect of these practices. In other words, what works for some kids in some areas will look different for youth in other areas based on their cultural expectations and experiences. There are a few key considerations when thinking about adopting and effectively implementing a program based on restorative practices. These programs have promised, despite the research limitations. Restorative practices can lead to improved outcomes for both victim satisfaction and for youth who are low risk or involved in the juvenile justice system for the first time. They also provide an opportunity to involve others from the community and outside of the juvenile justice system. For example, train the trainer approaches allow for expanding the reach of folks who are able to do this work. And they also provide opportunities to involve the community members and those with lived experiences in this process. Finally, given the current, st current staffing and ongoing budget challenges, these approaches can be used in many settings, require less intensive staffing requirements, and are quite cost-effective. Given our findings, the overall takeaway here is that restorative practices have promised but we need to know more specifically about what practices work, when, and with whom. So to that end, I'd like to introduce our main presenters who will be highlighting the work they do in this space. First, we'll be hearing from Sandra Santana at Community Works West. Sandra Santana is a dedicated community advocate who has been working in youth justice and restorative practices for 20 years. She is the program manager for the Restorative Justice Diversion Program at Community Works in Oakland, California, where she supports her team as they hold restorative circles for young people engaged in the justice system. Through restorative dialogue, she helps create alternative pathways for youth in the Bay Area and ensure they remain in their communities and out of jails and prisons. Following Sandra, we'll hear from Erin Politigo and Jasmine Fail at Restorative Community Pathways. Erin's journey embodies resilience, growth, and a profound commitment to healing and restoration. Born and raised in West Seattle, Washington, Aaron faced early tragedy with the loss of his father due to gun violence, an event that catalyzed his transformative path. Despite making choices in his youth that caused harm and resulted in a lengthy prison sentence, Aaron used his this time for rigorous self-reflection and embraced restorative justice practices. Now, as a referral administrator for RCP, he leverages his lived experiences to thoughtfully pair young people who have caused harm with community navigators, drawing on his deep understanding and empathy. Aaron's connection to his Samoan heritage and engagement in cultural practices like the Lakota Sweat Lodge provide him with strength and spiritual guidance, shaping his approach to healing and community support. His dedication to healing, accountability, and transformation reflects an unwavering belief in the human capacity for change inspiring a more compassionate and restorative world. Joining Erin, Jasmine has a passion for youth in the neighborhood and cares deeply about personal healing and the agency of youth. She has a background in social work and is invested in seeing her community thrive and grow together. As the communications coordinator, she has a passion to, re to integrate our values in the way and outcome of all that we do at RCP. Finally, we'll be hearing from Derek Frank, Derek is a senior researcher at American Institute for Research. He is a practicing restorative justice facilitator and licensed trainer with the International Institute for Restorative Practices. He assists criminal justice agencies, school districts, and community organizations with the development, implementation, and evaluation for restorative justice practices. For example, Derek serves as the project director for a National Institute of Justice randomized controlled trial, examining the effectiveness of family group conferencing 
to improve reentry outcomes for men and women suffering from addiction as they leave jails and prisons in Detroit, Michigan. Prior to his time at AIR, Derek spent 15 years creating access to restorative processes for justice-impacted adults and youth, crime survivors, and at-risk students. He worked with international experts in London, England on the world's largest randomized control trial of prison-based restorative justice. His victim offender dialogue work in Indiana's correctional system was featured on CNN's original series, The Redemption Project. While a specialist at Michigan State University School of Criminal Justice, he was a subject matter expert for the National Center for School Safety, led inside out prison exchange program courses, and was the faculty advisor for MSU's first student organization and faculty learning community focused on restorative justice. His research on alternatives to incarceration is published in leading criminology journals. So thank you to our presenters for being here and I'm going to pass it along to Sandra. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, like they said at the top, my name is Sandra Santana. I'm the program manager for our restorative justice diversion program here at Community Works West. Um, and I'm here to talk about restorative justice diversion. So just a little bit of a brief glossary to um, make our conversation a little bit easier. So when we talk about our why, we're talking about the responsible young person. Um, the person harmed is signified by a pH. If we use a surrogate when a person harmed is not available, um, PHS, community member, RJ circle, and accountability plan. We serve young people in Alameda County from ages 12 to 17. In San Francisco County, we currently support young people through the ages of 12 to 17 and 17 to 25. We work with young people who have serious felonies and violent crimes. Um, and we also support young people who are engaged in the school system as well. So some of the charges in the cases that qualify, we take serious felony cases, excluding most 707B offenses. We ask that there's an identifiable person harmed, so we don't, so we don't facilitate restorative circles for youth who are engaged in thefts from big box stores, i.e. Target, Walgreens, Walmart. Um, we particularly specialize with youth who have interpersonal um, difficulties, cases of domestic violence, sexual harm, cases where there's gun violence, car thefts, things of that nature. Um, yeah. So to break down our process a little bit, a youth causes harm, there's a point of arrest, that young person's case is then sent to the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office reviews that case, and if the case qualifies for restorative justice diversion, then the case is sent to us. Once we receive that case, one of our coordinators reaches out to the young person and their family and engages them in an enrollment meeting where they talk about the conference and the program and the extent of the support that the young person is going to be receiving. And then we go through a six-week prep, prep phase where that coordinator is meeting with the young person weekly to support that young person in writing an accountability statement to help support unpacking the incident and how that might have impacted the young person and the people around them. Simultaneously, while we're engaging that young person, we're also engaging the person harmed and helping them write an impact statement, helping them to engage in resourcing that they may feel they need to help be restored, as well as supporting that person harmed and being able to be prepared for conference as well. Once that six week phase is over, then we start to engage community members. So someone who is from the community who is able to speak on the harm at a broader spectrum, as well as support people for both the person harmed and the responsible young person. Once those, are, once those parties are prepped, then we hold a restorative conference. In that restorative conference, we, could, we read both the impact statement and the accountability statement, as well as create an accountability plan for that young person collectively. And then the remainder of that time in the following weeks is for supporting that young person through accountability and case management to make sure that that young person is completing their restorative plan, as well as getting resources to remove any barriers that could prevent them from completing the plan. This is just a little bit of research. We were lucky enough um, in doing this work for a decade that we were able to create um, 
that we were able to create a study of youth who have, were completed and sent through the program versus youth who were sent through the traditional adjudication system. Um, and you can see at the very bottom, I know this is really small, so I apologize if it's challenging to see. Um, in the, going through the traditional system, recidivism rates were at 34.6% after the first six months of completion of their um, original of the adjudication of their case and rearrest was 57.7 percent after 12 months going through the traditional court system going through make it right which is our program in san francisco rearrest recidivism was at 11.5 percent six months completion of the program and 19.2 percent recidivism rate 12 months after completion of the program Something that we've also built into our program that we're very proud of and, and feel has been a huge support is having a mental health component. So we have a bilingual English Spanish speaking mental health clinician that has been able to support all of our young people. So we offer free mental health services for all participants of the program. They can engage with individual therapy from the very beginning. As soon as enrollment has happened, participants are able to engage in, the, in, in free mental health therapy support Young people 11 to 17 are in our program for six months. And so for three months after the completion of their case, then they are also still able to access men free mental health services. And then our mental health clinician is able to support in finding culturally comprehensive mental health services post-completion and help to create a warm handoff to the next therapist and able to support. Similarly, for Tay, ages 18 to 25, they have um, a total time of 18 months in our program, and then they have an additional six months of therapy post-completion. And similarly to our juvenile cases, we, we support in a warm handoff for all therapeutic services from there on out. We also provide all of these services both in person, virtually, via Zoom, and telehealth as well. Once a restorative circle conference has happened, what we move into is our resource coordination. So resource coordination can happen both at the front end of the program during enrollment, all the way through the process through completion. So we do youth direct services where we work with young people, not only to develop a restorative plan in conference, but we also work with young people to be able to support them in accessing case management services. Um, and again, removing any barriers that we have when working with young people so that they're able to complete the program. We also do community outreach, community circles to just support restorative justice practices and engage the community in the process. And then again, that triaged kind of early case management. So when we have the, all these stakeholders involved in circle, during that prep time through coordination, we're really asking the young person to take accountability for whatever the incident is. The coordinators are meeting with them weekly. The resource coordinator is meeting with them weekly to make sure their needs are met. And we're really moving through the process of unpacking the arrest, unpacking the systemic harm that comes from an arrest, encouraging them to talk about the pro about what the incident accountability, what they would like to say to the person harmed, how they would like to move forward into accountability and teaching them restorative practice tools along the way to help support them beyond this experience. Similarly, we're also doing that for the person harmed. And so we're also making sure that we're engaging them in support services, case management for them as well, anything that we can do to also uplift and restore the person harmed. During that prep phase, the two, the two parties are not communicating, but we're slowly starting to prep them to communicate with one another, culminating in the restorative circle, which is a two hour circle process. The first hour being that we engage all stakeholders. They're able to read both the accountability letter and the impact statement to one another. And then we do circle rounds of questions and give the, every, all the stakeholders an opportunity to speak on how the incident impacted them, any questions they may have, any concerns they may have. Then at the halfway point after that first initial hour, we take a break, we provide food, everyone is able to sit down, break bread together. And then in the second half of conference, we, restore, we create the restorative plan. Um, I'm sorry, you can skip this slide. Oh, 
I'm sorry, the restorative plan slide is missing, but I can speak on that. So the restorative plan is um, something that we create to address the four parts of harm. And so in those four parts of harm, we're, we're creating a restorative plan to, to restore the self, the person harmed, the family, and the community. And so we have four stakeholders that are involved in that process representing each of those four parts of harm. And so every person in that restorative circle is gonna create goals um, for that young person that addresses that person that part of the harm. So young people often put things like job readiness support, resume building, um, interview prep, they can put on physical health goals, mental health goals that our mental health clinician can support in things like meditation, um, things like um, anger management support. Um, and then family is usually engaged in that process as well. So for family, we have things like spending more time together, family game nights, um, having a young person engage in family meal making. Um, so anything that can kind of support creating a more holistic and family wraparound environment for the young person. Similarly, for community that can involve things like community service, it can be involved in reading books or watching movies related to the incident to develop a deeper understanding of what has happened. They can write reflection papers. So there's all different ways for them to engage. Person harmed and person harmed surrogates typically have asked on the restorative plan, we support things like restitution, making sure that the family is capable of paying that restitution at less of a hardship for them. We also support, um, Persons harmed have put things like community service support, um, additional apology letters, things like that. So we really use the agreements plan to try to help support addressing those four parts of harm and really making it um, feel as restorative as possible so that all parties feel like they have the support that they need to continue to move forward. Once that, once that agreements plan has been completed through the help of resource coordination, then we move, then that we send that completion packet up to the district attorney's office. That district attorney then closes the case and it's as if that case never happened. So all of our cases are pre are pre-charge cases. So those charges are dropped, those cases are closed. And if they're under the age of 18, then those records are sealed. And that young person is given an opportunity to move forward without having a felony on their record. Um, so I think that's it for me. Again, I appreciate everyone's time. Um, these are the best ways to contact us if you have any further questions or, or any further would like any further additional information. Uh, good morning or afternoon to everybody. My name is Aaron Faltogo, and I am <clears throat> the Referral Administrator for Restorative Community Pathways. Uh, alongside with me, I have Jasmine Fale, Fale who is our comms coordinator, uh, and we'll be speaking to our organization. Um, Restorative Community Pathways is a community built and led organization. Uh, it was an organization that was brought together by community members who had been organizing in no new youth jails, stopping the school to prison pipelines, and primarily youth of our community. And when I say youth, I mean folks that are under the age of 25. They came together in a very uh, huge thought tanks um, and processes for about 13 or 14 months to be able to identify what it is in the community that we would like to address um, with system involved, system impacted, and addressing uh, the harm, uh, community members that have experienced harm. Um, I think you missed a few slides. <laughs> that shouldn't have been the next one. Is there one more before that? No, that's that's all I have. So the, the cover and then the second slide here. Uh, can we go back to the blue one? I'm sorry, my apologies. Um, no, the one that was just on. Yeah. Uh, the idea of restorative justice is that harm <clears throat> engenders needs and that those needs should be met. Who's going to meet those needs and how will people meet those needs? Um, this is a very huge idealism that um, we try to um, encompass and um, use in working with youth that have run in with the system. And like I said earlier, um, 
community members that have experienced harm. Um, giving folks the autonomy to be able to um, identify and address what they feel and what they need um, needs to be addressed. Um, <clears throat> there was a slide for our principles. <laughs> I don't know where that went. I really love sharing our principles. <clears throat> No. I don't know. We just go to the process one. I don't know what happened. Uh healing over punishment. Um, we believe RCP believes in healing over punishment, uh, being able to address the victim perpetrator binary. RCP works to actively change that um and how the legal system understands safety in our community rather than focusing, like it says here, on punishment and shaming folks are um, making <clears throat> you feel isolated and taken away from our community. We try to um, wrap them in support and care um, and again, let them be able to identify what it is that they are in need of supports and how that we can best address that as well as with um, uh, the, the community member that experienced harm. RCP supports every party in situations of harm, providing them resources, community supports, and restorative practices in order to ensure that all those involved are supported and able to move forward. Uh, if we can go to the next one. Um, RCP is deeply embedded. Uh, we, it's not seven, it's six. Nonprofit community organization spread out across uh, King County. Um, in what we call the consortium. Um, we specifically set that up so that um, each organization comes from a different background, um, ethnicity, so that we are eligible to identify um, with the youth um, and culturally be sound to, to give them supports um, in, in those areas as well. <laughs> Can we go to the system slide of how the referral works? I don't believe I have that. Yeah, you it popped up on there at one point in time. Oh, okay. Let me go back. No. There we go. So essentially, this is how um, RCP uh, works. Uh, we receive referrals from the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Uh, we have um, referrals of everything up to a second degree, with the exclusion of anything that is uh, sexually motivated. Um, as I spoke to the six organizations within our consortium, at each one of these consortiums, we house what is called community navigators. Um, and all of our community navigators are under the age of 25 and have been and have experienced um, similar situations as the youth that we are addressing so that it is peer led, um, peer identified um, empathy, you know, um, what is resonates most with youth, someone that, that can identify with someone that understands them, someone that knows exactly what they have experienced and what they are currently going through. Um, we have the four areas of sports and accountability. So with the alleged youth uh, that is being referred to us, um, as well as the harm party, uh, the four areas of sports, which we'll get to, um, is what we try to identify and being able to, to allocate and support um, in those areas. Um, with the exception of the accountability aspect with the alleged youth that we receive referrals for. Um, the accountability um, programming and support um, we identified as accountability is, again, not something that we shame folks for, not something that we isolate them for, um, and not something that we punish them for, but more so what is accountability, um, having an understanding of what your choices have and make on yourself, your loved ones, the individual that has experienced that choice or has been the other side of that choice and the community members surrounding all those people involved. Um, <clears throat> we have things like the dialogue accountability process, which Matthew was supposed to speak on, um, but could not be here today. Um, and that is where we bring both sides of the harm together after a very intentional 
um, deeply vetted um, process prior to going into that. We have healing circles. Um, there's one-on-one -on -one accountability processes. Um, and basically, you know, saying walking through what that was, what led up to that, what are things that are going on in your life? What are the, some of the experiences that you have? As we all know, um, with childhood traumas, um, the lack of development, um, environmental issues, um, housing instability, um, anything that is part of what is playing a role in choice making. Um, weekly connections. Uh, it is uh, very heavily um, involved that the community navigators are with these youth, um, basically on a weekly basis. Uh, understanding, you know, saying two or three times a week sometimes uh, and getting folks connected to any one of those four areas of supports, as well as just being there for them. It's not just about the areas of supports. One of our principles is building an accountable and meaningful relationship. So it's not just, you know, saying identifying areas that we're struggling in and addressing those, but it's as well as building that relationship, taking youth, you know, saying one on ones to go do something that they enjoy, whether that's bowling, boxing, um, riding a bike, wrestling, playing basketball. We have navigators that are taking youth out to go get their hair and their nails done and building that relationship so that a youth builds that trust, builds that understanding and that vulnerability to be able to speak to the things that are impacting their life and their choice making. And so that as the as the navigator is working with these youth, they're eligible also to identify key things that the nat that the youth cannot, you know, saying um, really identify themselves and finding organic ways to implement that into their um, program that they are setting up. Uh, long term community connection as well is very huge. Um, getting youth um, involved and introduced and integrated into community connection with other youth uh, that may not necessarily be um, have access to because of the area or a demograph, um, as well as community organizations and programming for whatever area, uh, things that they have interest in. Um, we have youth consortium that uh, is bringing youth all together to learn about organizing, music, speakeasies, uh, painting, um, whatever it is they have interest in and connecting them with youth that are involved in that and uh, organizations that are involved with that. Uh, if we can get to the four areas of support. Uh, basic needs. These are the four areas of support uh, that we have identified and try to allocate and support in both the alleged youth and the individual that has experienced harm. Um, basic needs, supporting youth and their family members and community members who have experienced harm in assessing basic needs such as housing and rent support, bill payments, grocery, clothing, mental and physical health services, and other needs. Um, as we know, a lot of youth um, are coming from a household that are struggling extremely financially, as well as um, <clears throat> other things that are going on in the household. So those basic needs is something that we um, try to address, helping folks get groceries, helping folks with their bills. Um, even, um, as we said, uh, physical and mental health services, we connect folks with, uh, counselors and therapists, uh, that they identify, um, that they can, can identify with. We get those services started. Uh, we try to maintain those services while trying to be sustainable and figuring out sustainable ways to, um, keep that family and their basic needs met. Uh, um, restorative justice and healing, creative collective spaces for healing and processes for healing and accountability for the youth and community members who have experienced harm. As I spoke to that a little bit earlier, um, the dialogue accountability processes, um, the healing circles, um, even some um, spiritual um, practices, if they identify with that as well, we have connected youth with. Um, connection, providing youth with peer support, mentorship alongside education, vocational opportunities and support services. So like, uh, again, like I spoke about connecting with youth or uh, with uh, community navigators that they feel are their peers and not someone looking down at them, but looking straight across with them and that they can uh, empathize with and identify with um, in a lot of those programmings, um, as well as being able to get youth tutors to help with school, getting youth in the um, jumpstart programs, um, vocational programs, tech programs, um, Job Corps, um, and any other uh, college um you know, saying uh, funds and everything. We we try to allocate as much as we possibly can. And then community building and holding space for intentional community support and organize centered and shared identity, no matter what race, refugee, gender, sexual, religious, cultural, and anything under the sun. Um, we try to identify with our community because this is what our community with. Um, and 
introducing youth into that again is vitally huge um, and feeling supported in that uh, and loved in that and cared in that. Um, we did not have a chance. We had the last minute to uh, change up because Matt had an urgent uh, issue to get to. Um, so we were not eligible to get the um, data slides uh, together. Um, but as far as our recidivism, RCP is a very, very young um, organization. Uh, we are going into our third year um, and our recidivism rate is about 8%. Um, that was after a year and some change. We received um, somewhere around 500 referrals and that is just of the alleged youth. Um, and it, with each alleged youth comes an individual that has experienced harm. So it's somewhere around 1,100 um, referrals, which we have received, we have reached out to, and have um, allocated services for um, uh, yearly. Um, <clears throat> I think there was one more slide. It kind of threw me off kilter, <laughs> missing our principles. <laughs> Uh, no, I think there was one with all our organizations in case anybody would like to reach out to, uh, feel free to contact myself or, uh, Jasmine, um, and Matthew at Collective Justice. If there's any questions, thoughts, anything you would like, and that is RCP for you guys. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Sorry about your little slide switch up there. Um, so my name is Derek Frank, and I'm a, a senior researcher at the American Institutes for Research. Also, um, for about the last 20 years, been a trainer with the IIRP, the International Institute for Restorative Practices. It's good to be here today to talk with you. So I'm going to speak a little bit about um, about the research process, but just taking a, a quick step back, and, and you heard our uh, fellow panelists speak to a lot of these um, points already. But really, you know, why are we even talking about restorative justice here, right? With with um, with youth, um, and it, you know, to me, it really starts with shifting the balance of power, right, a away from what are often harmful justice system practices towards communities who are most impacted, right? So empowering communities that are closest to the problem um, to have that power and responsibility um, and engagement, right, to address this effectively. You just heard Aaron talk about the importance of focusing on repair and healing over punishment. Um, we all know uh, about the harmful effects of juvenile justice system involvement for young people. Um, so a way to prevent some of those system harms um, that our young people are facing to really better align our responses to wrongdoing and crime with what we know effectively changes behavior. We know that the deterrent effect of punishment is very limited, right? And we know that young people and adults um, can learn more about their offense, about how it's affected other people. And we know that that learning and the relationships that can be formed, the repair, the healing, the reintegration can really go a lot further uh, towards effectively changing behavior than our traditional right responses. Um, and one thing just at the end here, and we see this a lot now in schools, um, I work a lot in the um, Genesee Intermediate School District up in Flint, Michigan, I'm based in Lansing, Michigan, um, is to re remember, right, that restorative practices is more than just a response, um, that so much of these practices and just the language that we use, right, um, the relationships that we can develop, the connections, Aaron talked about that, as a preventative measure, right, to keep things from um, progressing, right, um, and not simply as a responsive tool, but can we use these practices to hopefully prevent harm from occurring in the first place by building these relationships? Uh, just a couple highlights of some of the work I've done with IARP. Um, a few years back, the Indiana Division of Youth Services uh, became very interested in restorative practices. I think one piece we haven't really talked about much yet today is the value of restorative practices even after system involvement. So um, I will talk a little bit about a diversion program similar to the two that we've heard about already. Um, but one interest of mine is to really create restorative space at any touch point where a young person or their family might encounter a system. So 
for those young people who do end up in juvenile detention, who do end up in, in juvenile correctional facilities, what are we doing while we're there, while they're there, right? And so I was able to train uh, correctional officers and counselors and administrative staff at every juvenile correctional facility in Indiana in restorative practices using the IIRP model. And so that's just from every, everything from how to speak with each other in a more restorative way um, to addressing conflicts within facilities. Um, and we've heard some, some very um, positive feedback there. The other piece that they um, decided to implement was, was a family piece. So something I'm always interested in is, well, how can what you're doing already become more restorative um, by some, some minor tweaks, right? And so they had a family reunification program, but it wasn't really restorative there at, at their facilities. And they, so they began to do more, more of those family group conference type of practices at the correctional facilities. And I think an emerging field, um, that, again, that I'm really interested in and also becoming more uh, involved in research is reentry, right? So how are we preparing our adults and our youth to leave these facilities instead of just, well, let's hope things get better when they come home this time, right? So actually having some of those dialogues before they go home um, can be a really effective tool in their uh, reintegration back to their communities and their families. Um, and then the, the other big part of my work now is in schools, um, like I mentioned up in Flint, uh, where I was a part of an NIJ study um, where we randomized, we randomly um, assigned 10 buildings uh, in the GISD to receive restorative practices training. Um, and that included SROs. So these schools had school resource officers. Um, we went in and trained them um, on restorative practices, restorative dialogue, restorative conferencing, um, teachers in circles. Um, we've seen uh, we've seen some great results. One, one result um, that we found during COVID is that schools who were really adopting restorative practices. And that's a lot of that is the preventative piece among teachers had significantly higher attendance rates over Zoom during COVID than the schools who didn't. And so speaking again to connection relationships, we're seeing how much that much this matters. Um, and, and at a time when we were so disconnected, right, and still are in many ways, um, these buildings and these teachers who were doing restorative practices, doing restorative circles with fidelity in their classrooms, were really seeing um, that impact uh, on, on student attendance. The other thing we started to hear was that in the schools where the school resource officers were trained in restorative practices, students started to see police in a slightly different way um, from just a punisher, right, to more of a helper. And the police there also reported that they were developing stronger relationships um, with their students too, um, again, by using these, these restorative um, practices and, and, and tools in their, in their jobs at the school. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody on this call right now recognizes that one of the big challenges with restorative practice implementation is fighting the myth. There's many myths about restorative practices, right? This is probably the biggest one, that this is a soft on crime approach, that we are coddling young people, um, that there are no consequences. I hear this in schools all the time. So I think it's just, again, important to remember that the true meaning of restorative does not relinquish that accountability piece at all, right? And so that's why the blue box up at the top right here, um, the word IIRP uses is control. I prefer accountability, but this, this is the discipline. This is the limit setting, the boundaries. Um, that that should still be a part. And you heard from Sandra and you heard from Aaron about how their community conferences incorporate that accountability. And in restorative, that's hearing how your actions have affected someone else. It's taking responsibility. We know that our juvenile justice systems traditionally don't do a lot to encourage our young people to take ownership for their behavior, right? And to, to really understand how it's affected not only the people directly harmed, but their families as well. So I think this is something I come back to a lot um, in, the, in the trainings I do, um, is to remember that restorative, to be restorative, we're doing things with, we're not doing things to or for. Ashley covered um, this pretty well, so I'll just go through this briefly, right? We do know that 
with uh, youth, RJ practices can reduce reoffending, right? Um, you know, and there are various theories about why um, that's the case. We do know that through these dialogues, we're really getting at what's what's really going on, the underlying issues behind the behaviors that that, that can then be addressed um, after the conference. Uh, we know that people tend to be satisfied with this process, um, that it can help build some legitimacy. Um, we also know, and, and Ashley didn't cover this part number three, but um, some new research from uh, neuroscience of, of all places shows that participating in a restorative dialogue for people who have caused harm can actually in the brain create empathy, can build that empathy um, for, through just a hour, two, three hour long um, dialogue with the people who have been affected in, in their families. So some interesting research being done right now, uh, more cost effective as well. And really the more we engage communities as opposed to just thinking of a victim and offender, um, the more we know that could help facilitate a uh, successful reintegration. Um, what we still don't know, right, from the research end is, well, okay, so we see this effect on reoffending. Why? So what is it about the restorative process that's showing these promising results, right? So is it is it developing that empathy? Is it building relationships and social bonds with their families and community members? So we don't really know yet the mechanisms through which these restorative practices matter. So that's one future direction I think research needs to go. Um, what are some of the other short and long-term outcomes associated with RJ? Sometimes we get so preoccupied with recidivism and reoffending, and yes, that matters, um, especially to our policymakers and funding decisions. Um, but what are some of the other impacts? Um, are our young people learning? Um, are they building their capacity, their competencies? Are they strengthening relationships with their families? Um, how is RJ best implemented, right? Um, it's implemented widely different, right? Depending on the context you're in. So different conferencing models. I saw some questions come up in the chat already about training models and, 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 and how folks are trained, um, who's involved and invited to the process. And then Ashley spoke about this a little bit too, um, types of offenses. We are, I think, learning that restorative practices um, can be even more effective with more serious offenses. And for higher risk individuals, um, despite typically in practice, we, uh, you know, us seeing still, I think, a focus on uh, uh, on low level offenses, unfortunately. And then how can how can restorative practices really impact a wider systemic change? So addressing those structural inequalities that we see, um, we don't really know um, how these practices impact that yet. Um, and, and real quickly, um, because this is actually very similar to Sandra's Community Works West, uh, AIR is involved in an evaluation of the um, NOAB program. That's the Neighborhood Opportunity and Accountability Board out in Oakland, California as well. Um, it, it, similar to, again, to Community Works West, it's diversion at the point of arrest high-level misdemeanors and low-level felonies. Um, the important partnership here is with the Oakland Police Department and several community-based organizations. And much like Community Works West there in NOAB, they have a what they call a community accountability conference where um, volunteers from the community, and these are volunteers who have had former system involvement themselves, so they've walked in the shoes of a lot of these young people already, are incredibly invested um, in their community, volunteer their time to attend these restorative conferences with the young people um, and their families. Um, the victims of the of the offenses are also invited um, to this process. Uh, there's been a little bit of challenge uh, with, with NOAB and, and really engaging people who have been harmed directly um, to attend these, uh, but families are always, always attend as well as these um, uh, volunteer board members. Um, just a little bit about the process. Again, I won't get into too much detail here, but it, very similar to what you heard from, from Sandra, um, the, the diversion at the point of arrest, uh, NOAB meets with the young person within 48 hours in their family um, to explain what the NOAB program is all about. Um, this uh, culminates right in this, in this community 
conference where in that conference they develop a community plan. And so that might involve referrals to other community-based organizations to address the specific needs that young person presents um, and also provide support to their family. So I saw a really good question in the chat about uh, vocational training and employment. So that's one of the examples here of what might go on that youth's um, individual achievement plan, the IAP. So maybe it comes up that, yeah, they are interested in the trades and they'd like um, an internship or some employment training. That can then become part of their plan, um, very similar to the restorative plan that San Sandra mentioned, right? And so that those young people and their families can be connected um, to those supports in the community. And then after about nine months, um, the NOAB youth graduates and uh, their their charges are dropped as well. Um, we are studying everything from implement implementation to impact. So how does this process work? What are the challenges and barriers to, to implementation, including the referral process from the police department, victim engagement that I mentioned? Um, and then how could this model, models like NOAB, Community Works West, be replicated elsewhere? Um, what would that take? Uh, and then the impact study is really what outcomes are we seeing? So we're trying to address some of those gaps in the research that I mentioned earlier with this. So what are what's the impact on their school outcomes, reoffending their attitudes, their relationships, perceptions of community safety? So we are interviewing staff at NOAB, the community volunteers who attend these conferences, police officers who are involved in the referral process, just to kind of get a real a, a better understanding of how this works, why it works, and how it could be replicated. Um, just really quickly, uh, some some keys that that we've seen uh, to effective researcher practitioner uh, relationships co-design from the very beginning. So a lot of these really mirror restorative practices themselves, right? So we as researchers need to be doing things with rather than coming into communities and saying, "Here's what you need to study," or "Here's what's important for you to know." We should ask questions. What would you like to know? What information would be most useful for you, your community, your program, right? So we've uh, developed these stakeholder advisory groups where community members come in and help us design our research questions, help us design our instruments. And how could that best be disseminated? So how can these results matter uh, to you and your community and your program? Um, kind of getting past that, okay, we've done research, we've collected data, we've written a report, or we've published a paper, um, but how can we best communicate and translate uh, our findings to practice? Um, you know, having shared goals and objectives, trust is huge, right? Um, trusting the expertise, uh, you know, both ways in this relationship. We have to be flexible. We know that, um, you know, in, in this kind of work, things change. They don't always go according to plan. So to be able to uh, adapt and be flexible, constant communication is so important. And then what happens after the funding cycle is over, right? And so building that capacity uh, for sustaining these interventions. Um, so many of these programs, like the ones we've we've heard from today, um, are, are, are so dependent on external funding. And so how can we get, can I get to a point where we create a restorative, sustainable ecosystem um, when working with young people? And then just a, a couple things that I see as, as future promises in this work, um, you know, really bu buying or build, sorry, building the public and justice agency buy-in for this. Um, so, you know, we have seen uh, this successful in Oakland to a limited extent with the, with the Oakland Police Department. I think we need to do a lot more uh, to increase public support and awareness of what restorative practices and restorative justice really is strengthening again getting past that traditional idea of victim and offender to the wider uh, community of support and increasing that engagement in the process and their power in the process um, incorporating culturally responsive ashley talked about this a little bit earlier too and trauma-informed approaches to restorative practices um, is is very important moving forward and an area that we're just kind of starting to get into uh, and then building our evidence base right getting getting to those mechanisms about why we're seeing these positive impacts of restorative justice. Um, so many of our studies focus on short-term effects. So really getting at that long-term effect of reintegration. Um, how does this matter years down the road? Um, 
impact on uh, systemic inequalities and inequities that I mentioned earlier. We saw this in COVID, a lot of programs shifted to, a tech, uh, to, to virtual formats. So what are we learning about virtual restorative practices? What are the challenges with that? What are the possible benefits um, of, of using technology when it comes to a process that's very traditionally face-to-face -face in a circle in a room? And then there's some debate about this last one here, but um, establishing some standards of practice when it comes to um, how restorative justice works. Um, I think we, as a field, right, as practitioners and researchers have agreed on some general principles of what it means to be restorative, but how that plays out differs. I went to a prison one time, they said they were doing restorative justice, and I went there and I said, I can't wait to see what you're doing. Well, here's what we did. We, in honor of victims' rights, we, we planted a tree in the garden. So that was their definition of restorative justice. So I think I think we need to dig deeper into what this really means um, and, and how to build um, both that support and that accountability in, in practices that matter. So right on time, I'm all in there. Thank you. Well done, thank you. Thank you everyone for spending an hour with us. Thank you, Ashley, Sandra, Aaron, and Derek for sharing so much of the good work that you're doing. I know there were lots of questions that came up in the chat. Please take a screenshot of these emails and reach out to each person directly to ensure that you get your questions answered. I know that all would be happy to connect more with you and lean into that. And I truly hope that you enjoyed and took away a little something about restorative justice practices um, that we currently have showing up in the field, the research around them, and maybe some areas that we might want to uh, continue to explore as we move this practice forward. So thank you again for your time today. I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday.